and turn to Matthew chapter 17. I don't want to confuse you, but I'm going to read from Luke, if you don't mind. <laughs> but stay in Matthew 17, I promise. There's, a, there's more details there than you have in other Gospels. Um, but Luke has a really nice summary, so I want to read that for you. So Luke chapter 9, uh, verse 28, um, is the parallel passage from uh, Matthew 17, and then obviously Mark as well, has this same account of the transfiguration of Jesus. About eight days after these sayings, remember the sayings, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. I wonder if uh, you've been like me, but this week I've been pondering that a lot. I've been thinking about consecration, thinking about you know, refreshing my commitments to the Lord in terms of what it means to deny self, take up cross, and follow. And um, I'm so grateful that God gave the next little passage, not only in terms of a passage, but in terms of the event itself. So listen to this as encouragement to follow the Lord. After eight days saying these things, he took with him his close friends, Peter, James, and John. They went up a mountain to pray. And as he was praying, his appearance was altered and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with him, men we know well, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure. Look at the little footnote there. In your Bible, you have a footnote that describes the Greek being Exodus. So Jesus is speaking with Elijah and with Moses about his death that's about to come. It's a pretty awesome passage. Which was about to be accomplished in Jerusalem. Now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep. But when they became fully awake, they saw his glory, that being Jesus, and the two men who stood with him. And as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah, not knowing what he was saying. True Peter fashion. Okay, he interrupted what was going on here with these comments. And as he was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came from the cloud saying, also famous words, this is my son, my chosen one, listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and told no one in those days anything of what they had seen. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you, Lord, for your word. I want to thank you for your special revelation to us of this event and the glorious disclosure of things about you on this glorious radiant mountain. I pray, Lord, that I, I, as I believe this text to be a motivation and encouragement to believers, um, I pray that that would happen this morning, that as we listen to this event described and explained and applied, um, we would be able to follow you well, denying self and picking up crosses, and when I think about those things that we suffer for your sake, Lord, some of these things are very, very difficult. So, Lord, it requires of us that we would look deeply into what you have disclosed here of yourself so that we might be um, those that persevere, leaning and depending on the right truth. So help us to do that well today. In Jesus' name, amen. So I had the privilege... Um, a day or two after 9-11, if you remember that far back, to of the terrorism and tragedy that happened in New York City, I had the privilege of going to help as a volunteer and a counselor um, right after that event in New York and observed lots of things. I mean, learned lots of things about culture and about Christianity and about our human heart condition and all of that. Um, stories for another day, illustrations to be used elsewhere in sermons. But one thing that I remember is a repetitive line that survivors of those buildings being demolished said. And it was a line that went something like this, as long as there was light, there was hope. So you've got to think, people were buried under rubble for sometimes days, long periods of time, and so when darkness came at night time, it became quite terrifying. But when there was light, either from a flashlight of somebody or if there was light from the day, there was hope that there was possible escape coming their way. I, I see this passage very much the same way. I, I, I read this text and I see it almost like 
I don't want to be punny, but Jesus being radiant like this on the mountain is almost like God saying, here's a ray of hope for you to think about as you consider taking up your cross to follow me. Because taking up your cross would mean death for all of the close followers and friends of Jesus, for example, and for many who would commit their lives to follow Christ today as well. So assessing the following and the cost that's involved, we need some kind of glimmer of hope, and I believe it comes from this passage very, very strongly. This revelation was, for me, a taste of glory, a little opportunity for us to look at what heaven is like and to look forward to glory and be motivated by that. So I've been praying that this text would be an appetizer that's offered by God to do what it's supposed to do. What do appetizers do? Well, they increase your appetite. They whet your appetite for the real thing. And that's what I believe this passage is designed to do. So as we look at a few headings, I've got a couple of headings I want to hang this passage, this event on. Um, I want to give credit to Justin Dillahay, who has given me some insights here, alongside of many others who I've mentioned before in this sermon series. There are certain scholars of the Gospels that have done such a great job in explaining these details, and I just want to give him some credit. So the first heading I have for you is this one. We can only imagine. So write that down in your little journal. We can only imagine. And what I want to pay attention to is this idea of heaven and glory and try and unpack some of these details for you that have been a blessing for me, certainly, and I would love for them to encourage you as well. Notice with me a few things. No real order. I just want to lay them out on the table and then just imagine with you a little bit, okay? The first one is special revelation. God is revealed in creation. We know that. So much so that... Romans 1 explains every person that is born and lived on this earth will be without excuse when they stand before God one day because there's enough revelation of God in creation to prove his existence. That's explained in Romans 1. So generally God is on display, but certain times God will display himself specially. And we refer to the Bible as being special revelation for that reason, but there are these glorious occasions that we've been given that are recorded in Scripture for us, but of course experienced by these in a special way. And I think of this mountain as such an example. And it ties in with some of the characters, because the characters are Moses and Elijah. And I think back over your Bible and you'll realize Moses and Elijah both had mountaintop experiences with God, if you think back. You think of Sinai, for example, and I just want to point out some of these details to you. You can read about it in Exodus 24, and you'll read lots of similarities between what Moses experienced on the mountain at Sinai and what he was experiencing or the disciples were seeing of this conversation between Moses, Elijah, and Jesus now. The similarities like the six days. It's a simple detail, but six days, cloud covered the Mount Sinai when Moses spoke with God, very similar here. Cloud being something that's similar, glory being something that's similar, high mountains being something that's similar, Moses being a friend of God, the disciples here, close friends, Peter, James, and John, the closest friends Jesus had, close friends with God meeting on a mountain. You make these connections, you get quite excited, you know, that man is not writing the Bible. Um, God is putting the Bible together, inspired by the Holy Spirit over 2,000 plus years, 40 or so different authors, and the result is something very coherent for us to see and to trust. Notice something else. Notice the, the, the nature of Christ, the, the specific nature of Christ's deity on display. How that he was transfigured, he was transformed. And I, you know, I, th- I thought, that is a word we don't use in conversation ever. Like I don't think I've ever had a conversation where I've used the word transfiguration in, in, a, con- in a conversation. But I looked into the word itself. It's actually the word from which we get the word metamorphosis. So that'll help some to get the idea of what's happening in the passage. But to be transfigured means literally to give an outward expression of an inward character. So the best way to explain it to you, I think, would be to say the opposite. The opposite would be what we call veneer or masquerade. If you masquerade something, you, you're putting on an outward expression, an outward change. You're showing an outward change of no inward change. Does it make sense now? So transfiguration is putting on display what is essence now 
on display, and that for me theologically means a lot. I call the sermon radiant for that reason, because this is active radiance. It's not a reflection. See, Moses and Elijah, Luke describes, are both glorious. And he uses the word doxa to describe their glory. But I think what, what the authors are doing here, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, is they're, saying, they're using different words to teach us something different. Moses and Elijah were both reflecting some other light, whereas Jesus is the light. That's the point. He is deity, his dazzling glory, his splendor. Lots of scholars say this. They say it's like the veil of the glory of God has been opened just quickly and slightly for us to take a peek into the essence of Jesus, which has always been from eternity past. So try and swallow that, okay? It's awesome. This is awesome, this passage. Nothing short of dazzling, splendor, radiant, glory. All of these things can be tagged onto this passage. Um, and I, I thought about this as well. If Jesus has been radiant glory and splendor for eternity past, um, surely now that's how he exists. So seated at the right hand of the Father, I imagine the glimmers, the tastes of the transfiguration to be you know, exponentially greater, but that in fullness is how Jesus exists right now. In fact, the words that are used in the Bible, both Hebrew and Greek, speak to this idea that glory means radiance. It means light. So when you think of God all glorious, this is what we are trying to capture in our mind. While Philippians would say, Philippians 2 says, Jesus did not consider the glories of heaven something to be held onto. He let go of that and he came to earth. What did he do? He put a veil on. He closed up the veil. He didn't hold on to the splendors and the radiances of glory. But now on the mountain. A little bit of that shines through. So much so that his clothing becomes white like light. Read the details. This is our witness account given by these three followers of Jesus and, and shared with Matthew and with Luke. And the result is nothing short of awesome. In fact, the clothes shone so much. Look at the detail. They shone like the sun. Don't look at the sun, okay? It'll hurt your eyes. But the reality is that's how bright it was. It was to, to make an, a parallel, to try and share with us today what kind of light we're talking about, it's that bright in the middle of the evening. That kind of brightness is what we're dealing with here as a little piece of glory slips through into this world. Moses and Elijah both reflecting this light. Jesus is the light, nature of Christ. Then notice something else, the nature of eternity. The nature of eternity. Eternity is what it is. It's timeless. That's why we call it eternal. So notice for me, I don't know if you've made this connection, but did you know that Moses and Elijah were not mates when they were on this earth? Just put the details together. We're talking about a 700 years, as far as, well, I might be wrong here, but I'm just thinking on the top of my head, 1,400 years before this happened, 700 years probably before this happened, I think that's the right maths. There's a massive disparity between the two time frames of Moses and Elijah, yet they are together here on this occasion. That should blow you away. And they're talking to Jesus like they are friends because they're having a durative conversation. The, the language is in the tense to describe a prolonged, lingering chat. I'm not seeing enough smiles, okay? This is awesome that Jesus would be just talking to Moses. Probably, I, I don't want to venture into territory that we're not, we don't know anything about because we don't know the nature of this conversation, the content of this conversation, other than what Luke said, that it's about Jesus about to die. It's about the events that are going to take place for Jesus. But I can just imagine, hence the point, I can imagine Jesus asking the question, so what's it like, guys? Passing from this world to the next. I mean, here you are. You, you are glorified. So you made it. Help me get there to the end. And church family, you need to take that to heart today. Because on the, on the back side of an, a text that speaks about following Jesus, you need to know what's on the other side to finish. And that's why it's given to us, I believe, to know the timeless nature of eternity, the relational nature of eternity, that there can be conversations had across the ages of human history. And, man, Peter becomes, he's overcome by this as I'm hoping you will be this morning. He's overcome by the idea that this is good. It's good to be here, he says. 
He shouldn't have said it. He should have just remained quiet and just observed and taken it all in and listened. That's what he should have done. God told him so. But being, you know, the guy he is, opening his mouth before he thinks, and Luke told us that's exactly what happened, he says it's good to be here. And the word that he chose to describe the good is a word that means beautiful. It's, it's beautiful to be here. It's pleasing to be here. In fact, it goes a little bit further, that word. It goes to, even to the extremes of excellency. So it's excellent to be here. So let me make some shelters for you. And, and notice how self has already started to dissolve for Peter. I, I'm blessed by that because the previous passage said, you know, deny yourself, take up a cross and follow me. Peter doesn't build a shelter for himself. He doesn't build a shelter for his friends. He's building shelters for, for those that matter, the, the glorified beings that are there in his presence. It's good, it's pleasing, it's excellent to be there. So I just want to make that little first point that we need to imagine glory for a minute and aim for glory. And the best way to do that would be to think about this little piece of glory shining through. Heaven is going to be good, church. Heaven is going to be excellent. Heaven is going to be beautiful. Heaven is going to be pleasing. Not just the place. Because all of you are thinking, I want to make that as a complete statement. Some of you are thinking about the place right now. You're thinking clouds, aren't you? You're thinking gold streets. You're thinking mansions and stuff like that. And that's not the focus of the text at all. There's none of that stuff in this display of glory. But what is in the display is a person. And when you focus on the person, the radiance of his glory shining, his essence shining, all those other things fade. So it doesn't really matter what you're going to do in heaven. We know a little bit about what we're going to do in heaven. We know a little bit about what it's going to be like. But we know a whole lot about, what, about who is there, and that is Jesus Christ on display for us. And it's going to be good. It's going to be good. And I hope, I'm hoping, and I've been praying this week, that you'd be encouraged and be motivated by this. Remembering the context again, if you're following Christ, and you've made some commitments from last Sunday to this one about committing your life to Christ, this is where you're going. Live for it. If you're hearing this message today online or here physically, live for glory with your time. Live for glory with your money. We're allowed this Sunday in meditation on this passage to see beyond the realms of what we live in. Live for that. Stop living for what is temporary. With your relationships, the gospel has been given to us. Suffering, when you're in the middle of suffering, all of these things need to be ultimately hinged and connected to what is beyond this life. That's my first point. Can you imagine? Because if you can, it's going to be good. Number two, it's not about seeing or feeling. I, I don't know. I, I try to find better points, but this is what we have. I think they, they, they actually have landed quite well. It's not about seeing or feeling. And I, I don't want to miss this point idea in this text because it's very important. It's very important. According to God, who stepped in to interrupt Peter, to give him a bit of a word, the word of God is more, more important than even the display and the experience of him because they are so closely connected. The word of God is above experience. It's above vision. I'm going to say it again. The word of God is above experience and it is above vision. So if it's not about seeing and Christianity is not about feeling, then what is it about? It's about a few other things. Write them down. It's about hearing. What do I mean when I say hearing? It's the voice of God heard, the Bible heard. That's what Christianity is about. And when I say Christianity, I'm talking about what was spoken about last Sunday, the following that's Christianity, following Jesus, okay? Second, it's about the obeying of that word. So it's not enough to just hear it. You've got to implement it and you've got to obey it. You've got to say yes and act upon it. So it's acting according to the will of God. And there is no other way of knowing the will of God other than this book. Take that up with God, okay? But he's the one that's disclosed in special nature, his word to be heard, and the focus of the text draws right back to the word in hearing and obeying, and then thirdly, knowing, knowing. It's about knowing that Jesus is there, 
and that he's all you need. I may refer to this a little bit later, but I, I love that little line in, in this account where after the cloud has come and the voice has been heard from heaven, the cloud dissipates, it, 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 it drifts away, the, the glory, I mean, Elijah's gone, and, and Moses and his, and his radiance and display have gone, and Jesus is there alone. I, I just underlined that, because I think that's so important for us to focus on, that when all these other mountaintop experiences and visions fade, and we face the real valleys of life, so this descent from the mountain, Jesus is still there. Praise the Lord. So it's not about the seeing and the feeling. It's about the hearing, the obeying, the knowing. Ultimately, I would sum that up as listening to God. I would, I would sum it up in listening. And that comes out in this passage very clearly from God's mouth himself. I'll prove it to you in a minute. But before we get there, notice how the word of God is summed up so beautifully in this account. In the characters that were there. You've got Moses. Now, some of you are making this connection already. But Moses, we would call the lawgiver, wouldn't we? Author of the first five books of the Bible. I mean, here he represents the law of the Old Testament. Bam. And then you've got Elijah, the great prophet, who represents the prophecy of the Bible. And you put these two things together, and suddenly you've got your Old Testament summarized in the characters of the transfiguration. That is not a mistake. That is not a mistake. Because Jesus came to meet the requirements of the law, didn't he not? And he came to fulfill every single prophecy about himself given in the prophets. So when they fade, Jesus stands. The gospel fulfills the Old Testament. Uh, hallelujah, or praise the Lord. Or... It's so awesome how the Bible's put together. I, I just am blown away by by this, and after the first service this morning, a bunch of us talked about it after service, just got together and just said, wow, you know, our, our scriptures put together over so much time and so many authors inspired by the, the spirits that we would make these wonderful connections. Now, now, we give Peter such a hard time because Peter interrupts the moment and he, and he has some things to say that are really not even thought out. And I'm just grateful that Peter had a few years after this to fix things up and late in his life, in fact, right at the end of his life, the lights come on, excuse the pun, for Peter, and he makes this connection. This Old Testament, New Testament connection, he makes. And I want to point it out to you. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 12. You're welcome to turn there if you want. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 12. He makes the connection suddenly between... New Testament ministry of the apostles and the Old Testament ministry of the prophets. I want to read it for you. Listen to this carefully. Just to prove that it's at the end of his life, verse 14 says, I know that the putting off of my body will come soon. So here's Peter saying, I'm about to die. My, my, my life, my race is over. I've got a couple of parting shots I want to give to you. Important information for you to hold fast. And this is what he says. I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. So this is what I want to leave with you. Verse 16. For we did not, speaking of his ministry as an apostle of Jesus, we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were our witnesses Pause. In Deuteronomy, if there were two or three gathered together to witness an event, they were called eyewitnesses by the Bible. I wonder if potentially this is why Jesus invited Peter, James, and John as eyewitnesses, so that he would say this right now. And we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. So now we're going back to the mountain, the radiance of this occasion, the splendor, all of that. For when we received honor and glory from God the Father, that's what we saw, and the voice was born by him, sorry, to Jesus, by the majestic glory, so how God is speaking, this is what he said. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain, transfiguration. 
Verse 19, and here comes the theology. And we have something more sure. And I'm saying, Peter, you can't get better than transfiguration. All of us are saying that, aren't we? Man, I would love to have been on that mountain just to see and experience the event. And Peter's saying, there is something better. The word. You have something more sure. The prophetic word to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place. I can't get over this imagery. Until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first of all, first priority, that no prophecy of Scripture comes by somebody's own interpretation. This is not crafted by men. For no prophecy is ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit, and the result is the inspiration of your Bible. Peter got it in the end. He made the connection in the end that the word is ultimately important. So I want to encourage you to prioritize the scriptures in your life. How's it going? How's it going with the priority of the word, your dependence upon the scriptures in your Christian life? How is it going? Because the imagery that Peter gives us here that really connects to radiance is this whole idea of light where he says, this world is dark. It is a pitch dark place and we need the light of the word to lead us. Why? Because if it does, it will lead us to safety. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you've been in pitch black darkness and you've been groping around and there's obstacles all around and which camping or fishing and places and things like that come to mind where all you really desire is just a flashlight to turn on, just so you can be led by the light to something safe, somewhere safe. And that's the illustration that's given to us in these texts. So you may ask, well, Trent, how do I, how do, I do that? How do I allow the, the light of the word to lead me in this dark world? The answer, scripture will illuminate. Scripture will illuminate sin in your life and ultimately transform individuals. This is the promise of Scripture itself. And that's what Peter meant when he was talking about until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. Scripture will do that. If you don't believe me, believe Paul. 2 Corinthians 3.18, he says, And we all with unveiled faces behold the glory of the Lord, and we are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit, the same capital S, Holy Spirit, who inspired the Scriptures. Don't take your Bible for granted if this is the revelation God has chosen to disclose Himself to us. Listen to Him would be my advice. Listen to Him. Now, I don't even, that's not even my advice. It's God's advice. Let me show it to you in this passage. Back to the transfiguration. God has to interrupt Peter because he doesn't know what he's talking about. Bottom line, okay? The gospels make that clear. He's just so overcome by the experience that he's having at that moment. Hopefully, God will not have to interrupt you to say something because he will. I've noticed that as well. God will interrupt your life to say something very important to you. So listen before he has to interrupt you. That's my advice to you. He interrupts by speaking from heaven the same words we've heard before, and we've heard them twice, and we only hear them twice because God only speaks twice in the Gospels. Pay attention. God spoke these same words at his baptism, Jesus' baptism. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Identical, exact words that we hear now, and that's important. Two massive milestones in the life of Jesus. One at the beginning of his ministry and one at the beginning of the process toward his death. Very interesting. But on this occasion, he adds one little line to the end. I think for Peter and for you and for me. And that is these words, listen to him. This is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. Listen. Stop talking. Listen. Listen to my word. Listen to his words. That's the second point that I want to make today. It's not about seeing. It's not about feeling. It's not existential. It's about listening, obeying. It's about hearing the word of God. The last point I want to make is this. If Peter wasn't listening and he, he took God's advice, which I believe he did because his book, Second Peter, proves that. What was it that Peter was not hearing? And that's my last point for today. Suffering first, then glory. Suffering first, then glory. 
See, the Christian experience is, is a real one, which we all know very well, where there are times that we feel very close to the Lord and prayer is almost like we can have a conversation with God and we can almost imagine his facial expressions. But there are other times where, like the cliche goes, our prayers don't seem like they're going through the ceiling. We don't have any connection, it feels, with heaven. But this is our Christian walk. It is real. It has mountaintop moments and it has valley moments. And in one passage, we are given both. We're given mountaintop experience and then the journey downward to Jerusalem. And they're all captured in here for us to learn that both of these experiences, both of these situations, realities of Christian life are necessary for us. They are. What's so important to realize is that in the midst of both, whether it be mountaintop or on the descent, when the cloud settles, like I said a few moments ago, and the glories fade of the mountaintop experience, Jesus will still be there. He will still be there. From the valley, as far as the Christian life goes, there are always glimpses of glory. It's like this ray of hope that God has given to us to think about. And so Jesus comes to the disciples, and I love, I love discovering Jesus in the sermon series, because we've called the sermon series Meet Jesus for that reason, to meet him, and I hunt for that. And in this text, Jesus comes so patient to Peter and James and John, and he, he comes so gentle as a savior, and he helps them to process something which they're wrestling with. Because the last part of the conversation for most scholars and for you in your Bible reading probably has been quite confusing. What on earth are they talking about when they're talking about Elijah and you coming, Jesus, and all of these questions about Jesus going downhill to Jerusalem just doesn't seem to make any sense. And I want to make sense of that right now. So, so listen carefully. So the disciples are trying to swallow a paradoxical idea of the Bible, and that is suffering first, then glory. Suffering that leads to glory. And this may help you in your life as you suffer, because I think everybody in this room, if I'm going to be honest, is suffering at some level. We're in a very awful place, under the influences of a very awful, you know, person, and the results are suffering. It might be small for some to others, but for you it's not. It's suffering. And I'm hoping that this will give you a lot of, a lot of hope today. You see, Peter wanted glory to remain. That's, that's why he spoke. He said, this is utopia here. This is what we are all about. Glory, radiance, let's build tents, let's hang out. Finally, we've arrived. But a cross was necessary before glory. And so the disciples come and they start to ask Jesus questions. We just saw Elijah. So now what they were doing was a great Bible study. The Old Testament, if you turn to the end of your Old Testament, the last line of your Bible, this is very interesting, the last line of your Old Testament reads something like this. I will send you Elijah, verse 5 of Malachi 4, the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. There will be this wonderful reconciliation and this um, reform. So now, this is what's going on in their minds. They're thinking, we just saw Elijah. So where is the day of the Lord? What just happened here? Jesus, are you really the Messiah? Because as far as events should happen, Elijah comes and then now we have the day of the Lord. Glory, 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 build the tents. And of course, Jesus has to show them that they've made a mistake. They've chosen, they've, they've opted for the wrong Elijah. They've, they've made a connection with the Elijah they saw glorified on the mountain rather than the Elijah that is in the Bible. And the Elijah in the Bible is actually John the Baptist and Jesus goes on to explain it. That John is a type of the scriptures of Elijah. Just as John came to this world and suffered at the hands of Herodias and Herod, which we looked at quite recently, so Elijah suffered at the hands of Ahab and Jezebel. There's a type going on in the scriptures. And so, yes, you have seen Elijah, but it's not the Elijah on the mountaintop. It's the suffering Elijah, not the glorified Elijah. 
And he makes this gentle connection for the disciples to see at the end of the text, they suddenly finally understood, verse 13, Matthew chapter 17, the disciples understood that he was speaking to them about John the Baptist. And as John the Baptist came and would suffer and then be probably, we, we believe with all of our hearts, glorified, Jesus came to suffer and most definitely was rejected, died, and then was glorified. There's connection here. You see, the joy of Christian suffering This is the theology I want to share with you. The joy of Christian suffering is that it ends in glory. That no human suffering, Christian human suffering, is a waste. This is the joy of a passage like this. The transfiguration then becomes for us as believers a preview into that future glory. Just to see a glimpse of what it's going to be like to keep us persevering and enduring through whatever you may be facing. And so Jesus says something to end with, because you might be saying, well, what do I do now in terms of you know, responding to a passage like this with this theology of, of glory and the ideas of heaven and motivated to follow the Lord well because we're taking up crosses and we're denying self and we're following Jesus and we're inspired by glory. What must we do? What are we doing right now? It comes last in the text right here. Jesus tells the disciples not to tell anyone, which is strange to us. Just had this incredible experience and a very special disclosure of heaven and glory to earth and not supposed to tell anyone about it. So take your Bible and find this word with me. Matthew chapter 17, verse 9. Jesus commanded them, tell no one the vision, and then there's another word, until. Until. And he says, until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. And I pause for a minute and then realize that little word, until, is very important. Because it reveals to us a plan established by God. That the events for Jesus might, we're not sure. In his omniscience, he may know all the full details of the events going forward. For the disciples, they certainly did not know what the events were for Jesus lying ahead of Jerusalem down the mountain. But God had it all planned out. It's all established in the plan of God. And there's there's time sequences laid out here until there's gonna be a certain time that you're going to proclaim. So for a while, disciples, followers of Jesus, there's gonna be silence. Until Jesus is raised from the dead, he died and rose from the dead, then there would be proclamation, capital P. Then there would be proclamation. And church family, we are living in that age now, an age of proclamation. Where we've been given the new command, the great command here to go into all the world and share all things that have been commanded with you. We've been given clear understanding. We're looking back in hindsight of what we are to proclaim, the gospel. Both the glory of resurrection and the glory of transfiguration would affirm the power of our gospel. Amen? And so you're asking me, what should we do? We are a post-resurrection people, and we have the written word of God to aid us in our explanation of our glorious gospel, our radiant gospel, in the midst of our dark world. Parting shot for this morning, go and proclaim. Go and proclaim the radiance of our gospel to our dark world. We, We sang a song earlier. I was so grateful for the song this morning. On yonder hill where darkness flew. (laughs) Love it. Calvary, darkness seems to be prevailing, but the reality is that darkness is running for its life because radiance has arrived. The morning breaks in light and dew, resurrection. Day has come again anew, and all the sinners, we sing for joy. We sing for joy. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 6 affirms this. For God who said, he's the one that says, let light shine out of darkness. And he has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Go and proclaim. But know the cost. Suffering comes before glory. Glory. And a cross comes before a crown. Let's pray.
Lord, thank you for your help. We've all contemplated listening last Sunday to what it means to follow you, weighing up the cost, committing our lives to you afresh. Now we come to this text and we are comforted and encouraged to persevere through all the darkness of this world and what it means for us personally, Lord, for many suffering, serious suffering for your sake and the gospels, some laying down their lives for the sake of the gospel and your name. And Lord, we are comforted by a little glimpse of what is to come. My prayer, Lord, is that we would be able by your grace to focus on these things and hold them close and hold them dear. Lord, I pray that we would be those that are faithful in proclamation of the great truths that we have learned about today, of an eternal Savior who is glorious, who lives forever. And Lord, I pray that your word would be our guide each step of the way. Lord, motivate your church, Lord, and encourage your church today and make us missionaries of yours going into this dark world with the light of Christ. For it's in Jesus' name that I pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you.